Hello, hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to another Minecraft tutorial. My name is Shells, and today we are going to be moving on to a new architecture style. Uh, I know we just finished up talking about Gothic architecture not too long ago, but now we're going to go a little bit backwards in time and talk about its predecessor, Romanesque architecture. Um, so the first thing that you've probably noticed about this build is that it is horribly dark in here and that is actually on purpose. You see, unlike Gothic architecture, which featured large windows to illuminate the inside of the building, Romanesque architecture couldn't really support the openings needed to make large windows. So you get these itty bitty ones instead. Um, and most of the illumination that was inside the building had to be from artificial lighting. Which, of course, nowadays you get cool things like LED lights and electric lights that you could definitely light this up more, but um, time period accurate, um, it would look something more like this. You even wouldn't have lights up there. Um, and it would be pretty dang dark inside of Romanesque buildings. So yes, I'm aware that this place is really dark. Perhaps we'll go ahead and drink a night vision potion. <laughs> to properly illuminate things in here. Eh, much better. So, let's get into things. <laughs> Particle effects in the face. <laughs> so, what is the difference between Romanesque architecture and Gothic architecture? Well, like its name suggests, Romanesque architecture derives from the engineering of the Roman Empire, albeit Romanesque began after the Roman Empire and some of the old techniques um, for some of the big Roman buildings was actually lost. So it's kind of like Roman technology, but like a, a little bit clunkier per se. But the main feature of Roman architecture and also Romanesque architecture is the Roman arch. So what is the difference between a Roman arch and a Gothic arch. So here we have both of the arches side by side, Gothic, Romanesque. The main difference is that while a Gothic arch comes up to a point, a Romanesque arch ends up making a perfect half circle instead. And while that may not seem like such a huge deal to you, that little shape change makes a world of difference as far as how it functions in architecture. You can see, just looking at the two shapes here, that while the Gothic arch redirects the weight more downward, the Roman arch has, is a lot more squat and pushes more outwards, uh, so much so that this thin arch would actually topple by itself. So to hold up the outwards force exerted by the arch, the pier holding up the arch had to be reinforced with thick walls on either side. This means that all of the walls and piers in Romanesque architecture needed to be thicker, heavier, and beefier. In fact, most of the walls and piers tended to be built as a big old rectangle or square shape that they would then build up two walls, so they'd build up the whole rectangle and then fill in the rest with rubble. As such, Romanesque architecture tends to be, well, blocky and brutal. Whether the building was a castle, a church, or a townhouse, they tended to be large, imposing, and both visually and physically heavy. They also tended to be fairly simplistic in style. Most of the decor is either more Roman arches or buttresses. You tend to get a lot of flat walls with nothing on them. And as I stated before, the windows tended to be fairly small. See, the problem is that in Romanesque architecture, all of the walls are load-bearing. So if you weaken the structure of even a small itty bitty section of wall, it's going to try to crumble. In order to make any windows, the hole you're creating has to either be held up with a Roman arch, or it had to be held up with a post and lintel style opening. Uh, post and lintel being the architectural style that predates the Roman arch. Basically, two posts on either side and a lintel sitting on top. And while post and lintel works great for building stuff out of wood, which has a bigger tensile strength, 
When you're building with stone, you can only build so large before things start to break. So you either get medium windows that are supported by Roman arches, or you get itty bitty rectangular windows. You won't have anything like the great wall sized windows of Gothic architecture. And while they did have stained glass windows and rose windows, bar tracery wasn't created until the Gothic era. So the stained glass had to be made with plate tracery. And if you haven't watched my stained glass video, plate tracery is basically where every window had to be punched out individually. So you can see that here with my rose window. Um, you, it's kind of looks like you took a hole punch to it instead of the rose window being one continuous big window with intricate designs inside, it instead looks like a whole bunch of circles just kind of cut out of the wall, which is basically what it is. Now let's talk about the different kinds of vaults you would find in Romanesque building. There's two main types of vaults you would see in Romanesque architecture that are both based off of the Roman arch. Um, so the first one is this one here. Um, it's basically a big Roman arch that you put a whole bunch of them side by side and it elongates into a really big tunnel. Um, this is called a barrel vault because it looks like the side of a barrel. It's a pretty straightforward vault, but you can see how all of the weight of the roof is going straight down into those walls. So any openings in the walls, like windows, doors, or aisles, had to be reinforced with more Roman arches to keep it all standing. Barrel vaults were primarily used in building the nave and main sections of the building. It was basically the only way to have that much stone reach over the distance required to make large halls. If you didn't have a barrel vault, the roof in large areas would just be built out of wood and were basically open rafters and the underside of the A-frame roof. So if you had a large area to fill with a vault, it either had to be a barrel vault or something made of wood. You couldn't have any other stone vaults that could reach this large gap. The other type of vault is what's called a groin vault. Now, before you make any pelvic region jokes, the word groin basically means intersection, and that's essentially what a groin vault is. So if you had a barrel vault that intersects with another barrel vault, what you would do is just continue these lines out until they smoosh into the other one over here. And you would do that with all of your lines going all the way up to the very top. And they both kind of just smoosh together until it looks something like this. Now, you can simplify that a little bit by just having uh, four Roman arches going all the way around in a square, and then having them come into the middle and smooshing together. And you can kind of see that you get this natural curve going on in an X pattern going up. So the main difference between a groin vault and a ribbed vault is that a groin vault doesn't actually redirect the weight of the roof into the corner here. Um, instead, every piece of the groin vault is load bearing. Take a single stone out of this and the whole vault would come tumbling down. Um, and as you can imagine, that also means that this groin vault can't hold as much weight. It's certainly not as sturdy as a barrel vault, which is why it tended to be a lot smaller and was reserved for things like aisles and crypts. By the way, if you're wanting to know a little trick for making this look a little bit smoother, if you have a smaller circle to work with, um, if you ever want to incorporate slabs of any kind, you can see I have some slabs here. We don't have vertical slabs, otherwise this would look absolutely beautiful. But what you can kind of do to cheat the look is to put in walls. So this is these are just wall blocks here. Unfortunately, there is no exposed copper walls, so I may do with the mud brick walls. But my point still stands. So a stereotypical Romanesque structure was the large barrel vault going down the center with groin vaults going on either side. Uh, this is true even for contemporary buildings like castles and town halls, so don't think it's limited to just churches. 
I will also point out that there weren't any ground level uh, windows. You can see I have my windows way up high. This is because the walls needed a strong sturdy base. So the aisles were typically two stories high with the windows starting on the second story. The larger aisles also function to hold up the weight of the barrel vault in the nave, kind of like giant buttresses. So try to keep that in mind when you're building the proportions of your aisles. So moving on, we're going to be talking a little bit about piers and columns. Now, for the most part, Roman arches had to be supported by piers. Um, now, piers are these big chunky boys that are built a lot like the walls where you had a big rectangle and then they just filled in the center with rubble. It could be a rectangle, a square, or a circle to make a big cylinder. But let's be honest here. Piers are not exactly the most attractive things in the world. They tended to be pretty plain. So they took some liberties by adding in where they could some Greek styled columns. Um, now the thing about the Greek columns is that they had a lot more room for decoration. You had the base, you had a nice fancy capital, and you could otherwise carve it and make it look pretty. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, the columns were not as sturdy as our big chunky piers over here. So usually what you had to do is you had to uh, have anywhere you had a column, you had to have a pier on either side. So you end up with a lot of patterns like pier, column, pier. Or you'll end up with a pattern much like you see in these windows over here, which is pier, column, column, pier. Um, the other thing you'll see a lot is you'll see multiple columns right in a row. So you'll see like two or three columns holding up a single Roman arch. But the general idea is that you couldn't really have the entire wall here um, being supported by just columns. You have to have piers in there occasionally. Having said that, I have seen entire colonnades made with uh, just columns, um, but most of the time those examples aren't holding up your main barrel vault over here. Um, so I think it depends highly on how much weight it's being carried. And now we come to the last structure found in Romanesque architecture, the dome. So a dome is just a Roman arch that has been rotated around into a full circle. Or in the case of the apse, it's rotated around 180 degrees into a half dome. Um, and typically the dome is found in the very center of your Romanesque build, uh, regardless of whether you actually have the full crossing that you would find in a church building or not. One of the biggest challenges with building a dome is that you had to be able to transition from the square-shaped crossing up into a circular dome. Now there were a couple of methods for doing this. What you see here is what's called a pendentive. A pendentive is this triangular piece that just kind of shifts up into the circle. Um, it tends to be very round, and uh, as for building it, honestly, I just built the circle at the very top of my square and then just sort of filled in this gap. Um, it was pretty easy to just try to keep it as circular as possible going down into the corner. The other method takes a little bit more explaining to do. So the idea with this method is you want to be able to transition this square shape into an octagon because an octagon is a lot easier to build a round dome on top of than a square is. So you might be tempted to just kind of section off a, uh, a corner and call it good, you know, because that's basically what this method is doing is you're going to be sectioning off a corner to make an octagon. However, um, this little shelf here needs to be supported by something. 
So instead of just, you know, leaving it like that and building out a little corner here like you might be tempted to do, what you instead need to do is build up on the corners, oops, right here, where your octagon is meeting. And what you're going to do is you're going to build a Roman arch diagonally from this spot to that spot until it looks a little bit more like this. Um, now what you can do here is you can either still build up your corner and then just like diagonally attach these sections and go along here um, until they meet up with the wall over here. That is a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, but the other method that I've seen is a little bit fancier where instead what you do is you're going to build up this same arch shape from the corner up to the center. So then it would look a little something more like this. And as you can imagine, what you would do is you would just basically build a quarter of a dome for just this little corner here. Then all you'd have to do is build your octagon on top of that and from the octagon transition into the circle for the dome. This is what's known as a squinch. It's a little bit fancier than just, you know, bleh, being up to a circle um, and it'll look a lot better than just leaving a big corner shelf for your thing to sit on. As for the dome shape itself, I'm sure you're all wondering how to build this thing by hand or even how to make one using World Edit. However, I feel like the specifics of that would be better explained in its own video. I feel like if I tried to explain it here, this video would be way too long. So unfortunately, we're going to have to go ahead and move on. I'll make a video solely dedicated to it, I promise. <laughs> All right, so the final thing I have to mention is the roof. Now, when I first built this building and posted it to Reddit, um, I actually built the roof wrong. And I was kindly corrected by a user named Farts and Prayers. Thanks, Farts and Prayers. Your comment was very informative and helpful. You see, I was so used to building gothic roofs that I assumed that it would be the same basic concept. Um, just, you know, a little bit simplified. And while that's mostly true, I still had the climbing peaks of gothic roofs and spires. But as was pointed out to me, Romanesque roofs aren't nearly so tall. Um, it was stated that Romanesque builds shouldn't exceed a 45 degree angle. And while I still feel like that's a little bit extreme, especially for the spire, um, I did try it here and I will say that the roof definitely looks more Romanesque now than it did before. Though I will note that if you come down here it looks a little bit, uh, flat. So I, I don't know, um, I don't know if I like the strictly 45 degree angle. It feels a little bit too extreme to me, but, um, just keep your, keep that in mind. The other thing I had to change for the roof was I actually had to change the color of it. Um, typically Romanesque builds used uh, a terracotta tile in order to build their roofs, so they tended to be a reddish hue. But color is a little bit funny for builds because honestly you can build it out of whatever you want. But I think it was important for me to change it because I was trying to be as true to the era as possible. And that's pretty much the basics of Romanesque architecture. I know, I know, that was a lot of me talking at you, but once again, knowing how to build something is mostly understanding why things look the way they do and breaking it down into pieces. I will say that building in the Romanesque style for me was a little bit of a challenge. I think part of me was just itching to add more detail since the style itself dictates a more simplistic look. And as predicted, I kind of got torn a new one for it when I initially posted my build to Reddit. Though I think a great deal of that was because of me trying and failing to make this gradient work. 
Um, initially, my gradient looked a little bit like a mudslide had gone through and sullied the bottom of my build. And I think a large part of that was because I was trying again to make a gradient work between mud bricks and endstone. For those of you who watched my Temple of Time video, I spent a great deal of time trying to make a nice transition between mud bricks to the end stone bricks because I looking at them they look like they should go together great um, but uh, ultimately I failed and I was trying that again um, and it didn't work and people on reddit were more than happy to point out to me that it didn't work and they were right so in the end I ended up having to completely redo this gradient and ironically I ended up taking out both the mud bricks and the endstone bricks. Go figure. That didn't work. But um, this one looks a bit better. I still had some complaints that said that it looked too busy um, and you know, they're probably right. But for me, I was trying to make this simplistic build look a little bit more interesting. I guess to close, I can say that Romanesque architecture is going to be a popular go-to for a lot of builds since most castles and classical buildings tend to use Romanesque architecture. But having said that, the joy of Minecraft is that you can adopt any style you want and it doesn't have to follow strict rules about what was historically accurate or not. Knowing the basics will just help you make design choices in the future. So you don't have to keep the build as simplistic as this one, but you can still use things like barrel vaults, groin vaults, and Roman arches. I mean, heck, a lot of modern buildings take inspiration from the Romanesque era and incorporate these things into buildings all the time, and they don't have to be limited by what was possible back then. So hopefully this video has helped you get a better understanding of the style so that way you can go out and incorporate some of it into your own builds. And here's where I apologize for taking so long to get this video uploaded and admit that this video was a bit of a challenge for me to make. Romanesque is not exactly my forte and especially after the roof fiasco, a part of me was a little terrified that I got some parts of it wrong. So if I misrepresented something or was otherwise flat out wrong, Please let me know in the comments. I would much rather be uh, corrected than not. And I'll admit that I was kind of putting off making this video because I was a little bit worried that I had my facts wrong. So I ended up playing a whole bunch of Tears of the Kingdom instead of doing this video. Um, and then I caught COVID, which knocked me out for a month. It has been a month since I caught COVID and I still have a cough. So, uh, yeah, I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, hopefully now that this video and the sickness are behind me, I can pick up the pace and get more videos out to you again. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. I'm really grateful for all of you for taking the time to watch my videos. Hopefully you learned something, and I'll go ahead and see you in the next one. Goodbye!